Uh, so hello everyone and welcome. In this session, you will learn from a panel of global, regional, and national agencies about how geospatial data is being used to support COVID-19 response and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I will be the moderator for this esteemed panel. My name is Io Blair Fries, and I am a program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation within our global delivery programs. We're going to start today with some presentations from our panelists. After the presentations, we will have a discussion and Q&A from the audience, and then use closing remarks from our discussant. Please use the attendify comment section for the session to leave questions during the session. Today, you're going to hear from R.G. Cavada, Program Manager for Sustainable Development Goals at NASA, Dennis Waniki, Spatial Data Expert at the Data and Analytics Unit within UN Habitat, Rolando Ocampo, Director of the Statistics Division, at Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, Sandra Liliana Moreno, Director of the Geostatistical Division at Colombia's National Administrative Department of Statistics, His Royal Highness Prince Clem Ikenade Agba, Minister of State for Budget and National Planning of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Co-Chair of the Grid 3 National Steering Committee, David Moinina Senge, Minister of Basic and Senior Secondary Education and Chief Innovation Officer for the Government of Sierra Leone, and our discussant, Juan Daniel Oviedo, Director of Columbia's National Administrative Department of Statistics. RG will start us off. Great, thank you, Ayo, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. Uh, so Ayo mentioned uh, that um, a little bit about myself. So I work at NASA leading activities that focus on enabling uses of Earth observations for sustainable development goals. I also serve as the Executive Secretary for an international initiative, EO for SDG, or Earth Observations for Sustainable Development Goals. And that initiative uh, uh, focuses on uh, enabling global knowledge about uses of Earth observations for sustainable development. So let's go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to start off by looking at uh, the, the current situation with the global pandemic uh, and how that uh, fits into the broader efforts that countries have committed to in terms of achieving sustainable development by 2030. So based on the Sustainable Development Goals Report 2020 that it was issued this year by the UN Secretary General, even before the pandemic, progress had remained uneven with respect to meeting the SDGs by 2030. Some visible gains included improvements in uh, sectors such as uh, improving access to safely managed drinking water, as well as in areas such as increasing leadership of uh, women in leadership roles worldwide. At the same time, Many people continued suffering from food insecurity, and that has been on the rise, in addition to alarming levels of continued natural environment deterioration and persistent inequality across regions. And so now, especially with uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this unprecedented health and economic and social crisis uh, represents a key threat to the progress, albeit uneven, that countries have been making in reaching the SDGs worldwide. And so in addition, this pandemic and its effects have been exacerbated in some cases by the impact of the uneven progress in areas such as uh, clean water and sanitation, uneven economic growth, in addition to persistent poverty and food insecurity. And so the UN Secretary General has therefore called for a coordinated and comprehensive international response effort that is based on science and sound data and is guided by integrated frameworks such as the Sustainable Development Goals, um, uh, part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So let's go to the next slide, please. And so in the next couple of slides, I want to talk to you about some efforts that highlight international collaboration and partnership and showcase how different institutions worldwide have come together to help uh, uh, put the data to work and, and, and to the hands of, um, of countries across regions so that uh, they can be used to better monitor and assess the impact of the global pandemic and um, related measurements that have been taken. And so here, you see highlighted 
uh, a collaboration among the European Space Agency, ESA, the Japanese uh, Aerospace Exploration Agency, and NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States, who have come together to develop a dashboard that helps combine resources, technical knowledge, and expertise of these partnering agencies to help strengthen global understanding of the environmental and economic effects of COVID-19. And so as human behavior has changed in the recent months as a result of social distancing measures and other such practices, ongoing measurements from Earth observing satellites and instruments have detected uh, concurring changes in environmental factors such as air pollution, in addition to changes in urban heat flux, uh, the impacts of reduced uh, traffic, industrial activity, as well as reduced tourism in um, urban and agricultural sources of pollutants and, and thus water quality. And so here through this dashboard, this dashboard makes available a number of different indicators, including economic, agricultural, and environmental indicators, and provides an opportunity to explore uh, these indicators and look at individual countries and regions across the world to see how these indicators have changed through time, especially in the past uh, several months. Next slide, please. In addition, and diving into a more specific example here, so you can see um, here, air quality related changes in response to COVID-19 mitigation efforts. And so air pollution, air pollutants such as nitrogen dioxide is one example of, an, of a pollutant that um, is unhealthy to breathe and contributes to the formation of unhealthy levels of surface ozone pollution. It serves as a precursor. And here you see um, highlighted um, how combined data from different satellites, so from ESA's Copernicus Sentinel 5P satellite, in addition to the um, OMI instrument on board the AURA satellite from the joint NASA um, Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute uh, collaboration, show significant changes in concentrations of nitrogen dioxide that have coincided with reduced traffic and industrial activity. And so you can see here in the figures on the right, changes that have occurred in the northeastern US as this compare from a 14 day period in 2020 compared to that same period for the 2015, 2019 average. And so this is just one example of how Earth observation data can and are being used to assess impacts of uh, um, change in the environment and also on society and, and human health. And so the NASA OMI team has created a portal that allows uh, access to and, and enables monitoring of how satellite NO2 has changed in, in the recent months. And so you can see the link to that portal included on the slide. Uh, next slide, please. I also wanted to highlight a couple of uh, global networks and communities of practice or initiatives that exist that help bring together governments, organizations, and also observers to help use environmental observations to improve health decision making at the international, regional, country, and also sub-national levels. And so the GeoHealth Community of Practice, the Group on Earth Observation Health Community of Practice, is one such example of a a, an effort that, especially in the recent months, has uh, um, brought together earth scientists and stakeholders from across the globe to help share research applications and related activities that use earth observations to advance knowledge on COVID-19 impacts as well as transmission rates. And so you can find more information on the GeoHealth community of practice and um, I realize there is no link, but I will make sure to share the information or you can just uh, search for GeoHealth Community of Practice to find information or ways to engage. If you're interested in getting involved and in learning how to use the data uh, to help assess impacts of COVID-19, but also if uh, you are already using uh, geospatial information and Earth observation data and are interested in getting involved in some of these activities. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, I wanted to also 
share some information on the EU for SDG initiative that I also mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So this is another global effort uh, within the Group on Earth Observation that focuses on advancing global knowledge about effective ways that Earth observations and geospatial information can support the SDGs. And uh, more recently, one of the projects we have been working on with UN Habitat, in addition to um, a suite of, um, of partners at uh, the both global as well as country and city government level, is the development of an online resource, um, knowledge resource, um, the Earth Observations Toolkit for Sustainable Cities and Communities. And so this effort focuses on helping serve as a first step for countries and cities interested in applying Earth observations to support their SDG monitoring needs and urban policy priorities. And you can find more information about this at the eo for sdg website as well as by following us on Twitter at eo for sdg I think this is my last slide. Uh, can we go to the next, please? I believe so, and so there is the information that you can access. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the rest of the panel and, and great uh, discussion as well. Thank you. Hello, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take uh, over from where Aji has left. I'm Dennis Moniki. Uh, I work at UN Habitat's uh, Data and Statistics Unit, and I, I support a lot of the data uh, production processes, especially where the use of other observation and geospatial information are, are required. Uh, so today I just want to talk about some of the global activities that uh, we are doing, particularly in terms of urban monitoring, uh, but also how we are using geospatial information and other observation to support the COVID-19 response. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, yeah, I want to start first by saying that uh, in, in, in the current uh, discourse which we are living in with the COVID-19, uh, COVID uh, a lot a lot of uh, things are actually connected, not just to the virus itself, but also how our settlements are structured and how, how our settlements and how people live in, 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 the, in the different parts of the world. Uh, and a lot of the risks that uh, are associated with COVID-19 and, and also the risk of the virus spread uh, they are also directly connected to the space standards of the, the, the places where people live, uh, the, the kind of the infrastructure that exists, the provision of basic services, and, and how rapidly or fast the uh, urban areas and also countries at large are able to respond to, to, to the crisis. So, so this has a lot to do with the availability of data first, but also how this data is usually used to, uh, to make decision or in decision-making processes. Uh, and for us, from uh, speaking from the UN Habitat perspective, is that we, we are involved a lot with the urban monitoring. Uh, and here is one of the places where we've had a lot of problems with data availability, specifically for uh, city level kind of information. In many countries, we have national level information, we have urban stroke uh, rural uh, sort of data. But for many countries, we have data which is largely available available for capital cities or the largest cities, uh, which leaves out a lot of the other urban areas. So cities are sort of uh, not re properly represented or their trends not uh, clearly understood. Uh, so, so within the, the monitoring framework that uh, we're operating under and currently the SDGs monitoring framework, uh, there has been a lot of calls for integration of new types of uh, data. And here, one of the most uh, critical ones that is, uh, is, is being encouraged is the use of geospatial information uh, and also which directly also ties to the use of other observation products and here just quoting two uh, resolutions the first one is the, uh, the principles of fundamental statistics uh, it, it re encourages the use of alternative data sources into statistical systems uh, the other one is in the sdgs monitoring framework uh, there is a recommendation for national statistical office and other data producers to use uh, uh, other other sources of information including just special information community source of volunteer data and other sort of data sources uh, and uh, uh, like 
in any monitoring uh, framework, whether it's urban or it's uh, national or it's rural, uh, every indicator that is usually measured has a direct link to space. So we need to understand how whatever numbers we have or whatever information we produce relates to space and how this affects the ways of life of different groups of people. And this is usually very significant in the agenda of leaving no one and no place behind. Uh, but there are those also specific indicators specifically within the SDGs monitoring framework. And here, uh, just referencing SDG 11, that is the sustainable cities and communities, there are those indicators which rely directly on the use of geospatial information and other observation tools. And these ones uh, specifically include the monitoring of the housing conditions. And this looks at uh, slums versus non-slums, uh, looking at the, the other indicator is the 11 to 1 on the transport, a uh, provision of public transport. The other one is how urbanization is shaping up in terms of space and also population demographics. And the other one is also on the, the provision of open spaces. Uh, so, so these are just some examples of where uh, direct use of bad observation is uh, required in, within the SEG 11 monitoring framework. And this, uh, uh, there's a lot of documentation for, from our side on how we are integrating this into the measurement. Next slide, please. Then the next slide just talks very briefly about uh, how geospatial information can be used or is being used to support the COVID-19 response. I started by saying that uh, COVID uh, activities are directly related to broad urban monitoring perspect, uh, sort of uh, approaches. Uh, and here, one of the most uh, significant uh, things is uh, use of uh, geospatial information and other observation products to really identify risks and vulnerabilities of populations by looking at settlement patterns and where people are. Uh, we apply at a lower scale uh, geospatial information to also sort of uh, do uh, sort of localized mapping on, on specific uh, vulnerabilities and risk. And this could include uh, identifying which uh, services are available that are directly connected to response, then using that information to sort of identify uh, what kind of specific interventions are required. In many contexts, you there's a, there's a conception that uh, like in informal settlements, they don't have access to services. But uh, based on service that we conducted in some countries, is that actually the, the core infrastructure is there, but the reliability of the, the services themselves that are required in those infrastructure is missing. And that directly ties to understanding where the, the services are required and how that can be used to, uh, to in, the, in the COVID-19 response uh, system. Uh, last slide, please. So here, the last slide here just talks about some of the emerging scenarios in different places uh, where we have uh, both opportunities and challenges. And the challenges from the global perspective include things like uh, lack of capacity. Uh, there's a big uh, barrier in terms of uh, the resolution of the, both geospatial data and statistical data. Uh, geospatial data is improving, statistical data is uh, also improving, but the, the sort of uh, the scales are, are different in terms of how much this information is uh, can be brought together and be used for decision making processes. Of course, other things include the, how fast some countries are adopting these technologies in their mainstream uh, uh, work. And a lot of the challenges we've seen, at least from our side, is that a lot of partners working in different uh, directions, while also in, instead of working towards to achieve the same thing. Uh, and uh, but of course, we see a lot of activity also in the geospatial community, as you mentioned, and this we see as a kind of opening a lot of opportunities for, for improved urban monitoring in going into the future. Uh, I'd, I'd like to stop there. Uh, that is my slide. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, good day, everyone. My name is Rolando Campo. I am the director of uh, statistics from ECLAC. Um, and I want to thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to be part of this session. In this presentation, I will refer to the integration of a statistical and geospatial information as a relevant process that needs to be conducted. And in this uh, particular moment, in order to provide a better response to COVID-19, supported by the coordinated and collaborative effort between the statistical and the geospatial community. Next slide, please. In our region, we have uh, realized that the progress in integrating statistical and geospatial information is correlated with the existence of the special data infrastructure in the countries. As illustrated in the slide, 
The integration process has yet to begin in most of the countries with no established special data infrastructure. Conversely, in many countries which do have such infrastructure in place, initial conversations are underway or the process is already being executed to one or more pilot programs or under a formally established medium or long-term program of work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the question is then, how do we make the integration of statistical and geospatial information sustainable in time? The responses are being provided from the initiative of UNGGIM, the Global Geospatial Information Management from the United Nations through the elabor elaboration of and dissemination of sound guidelines that can support this process at the national level. The first one is the Integrating Geospatial Information Framework, the IGIF, that provides a guide for developing and maximizing geospatial information management and related resources in all countries, strengthening their national SDIs uh, through the nine strategic pathway of the IGIF, countries can advance in the institutional arrangements policies, partnerships, data management, standards, innovation, capacity building, and communication. The IGIF uh, implementation guide has a specific section of how to apply these pathways to the integration of statistical and geospatial information. The second framework endorsed by UNGGIM at the Statistical Commission of the United Nations Statistics Division that has proven to be useful uh, implemented to monitor COVID-19 is the Global Statistical Geospatial Framework, the GSGF, which enables a range of data to be integrated from both statistical and geospatial communities and through the application of its five principles and supporting key elements uh, permits the production of uh, harmonized and standardized uh, geospatial enabled statistical data. The resulting data can then be integrated with the statistical, geospatial, and other information to inform and facilitate data-driven and evidence-based decision-making. The integration of statistics and geospatial information has been vital in this pandemic. For instance, sociodemographic variables such as age, health status, have been analyzed even at block level to detect um, vulnerabilities. The next slide is slide, please. And as I mentioned before, to achieve the integration of statistical and geospatial information in our region in Latin America and the Caribbean, it is crucial that both communities work together, supported by the valuable guidance provided from the global level through the implementation of frameworks previously described. In this regard, we are happy to share with you that the, in the Americans, since 2017, several milestones have taken place as a result of the encounter, uh, of, encounter of a statistical conference of the Americas of ECLAC and UNGGIM Americas in order to coordinate efforts and define a joint agenda. The last one endorsed in November of 2019 was the declaration of the integration of special and statistical information between the Statistical Conference of the Americas and UNGGIM Americas at the 10 minute of the Statistical Conference of the Americas. As one of the relevant results of these regional agreements in, the, in a joint effort between UNGGIM Americas and ECLAC, with the support of the Secretariat of UNGGIM at the global level, two regional uh, uh, webinars and a regional cons uh, consultation regarding the special response to COVID-19 were conducted in order to collect information and share experience and knowledge from, um, from different approaches ranging from institutional to technological. From the collected information through the different activities and consultation carried out, in the region, it was possible to realize that the most frequent technological resources being utilized to disseminate COVID-19 st statistics are geospatial dashboards. Most countries 
are using GIS to disseminate statistics related to confirmed cases, active cases, recovered cases, and deaths at different levels of disaggregation, such as political administrative divisions, gender, or age groups. In this uh, 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 remarks, in, in ECLAC, we have developed a, a platform, a geoportal, with information for the, uh, the COVID-19 responses that the, the measures that countries have made in this regard for, to, to attend this, this, this pandemic. Finally, as a closing remarks, I would like to reaffirm ECLAC commitment to continue strengthening institutional links to move forward with the process of integration of statistical and geospatial information at the regional level, understanding that the result of this integration is a crucial input for evidence-based decision-making, especially in the context of this pandemic that is strongly hitting our planet and our lives. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. It's a pleasure to me to be here. I introduce myself. My name is Sandra Moreno. I am the technical director of the statistical department in the National Statistics Office in Colombia, DANE. And in this part of the panel, I want to share with you the Colombian experience in the use of geospatial information to support a COVID response. So, uh, specifically, I want to share with you the per block vulnerability index geovisor. So first of all, in Colombia, for the response to the COVID, the DANE identified the need to provide timely information with high degree of territorial disaggregation that will guide decision making. For this reason, DANE worked with other institutions to exchange information. We work with the National Planning Department and the Ministry of Health and Social Protection to identify the population that could be presented bigger risk to COVID-19. To COVID so we based our efforts to identify at block level uh, a population and database about age, sex, comorbidities, and condition of habitability. So in this matter, all adults over 60 years of age were identified as vulnerable people. Also people with pre-existence of hypertension, diabetics, chronic respiration disease, and other issues. So all this information that we have at block level was collected thanks to the use of the national population housing census and the use of administrative records that we receive mainly from the Ministry of Health and Social Protection. So we combine and use all this information at per block and we use a, a method about K-means to cluster this information and at the end calculate the vulnerability index. Next slides, please. So as I mentioned before, with all this database that we collect, we calculate vulnerability in this, which give information about the degree of vulnerability for COVID. For dissemination purpose, we have published, um, we have published a geovisor that allows the consultation of this information. But also we include all the ledgers of information. For example, in this link that you can see in the left side of the slides, you can access to this visor and consult the information. You have access to the vulnerability in this, but also you have access to the multidimensional poverty index. We have access to the number of facilities that could be medical centers or hotels. Also, you can uh, access to the percentage of older adults and recently we include the mobility index. So we can access to all this information. Next slide, please. Also in the application, we put available different tools and yes, options which the users can be, for example, activate the 3D view, which facilitates the consultation of information. In the picture of the right side, you can see in the 3D view 
of Bogota areas. So in the areas with higher hay is related with more vulnerable. So these options be easy to consult the information for everybody and to try to understand what are the future of the characteristics in a specific area. Additional, um, we, can, we activate the option to download the information. It's possible to download all these layers of information in a shared file format. We, we activate this option because we want to promote the use of this data. The idea is that everybody, so, social um, citizens, a user from the private or public sector can be access to this information and use it for other purpose. For example, um, we can know different experience. For example, the major office of Bogota, for example, used this information to guide the citizens' policies on confinement. So this is a, a good example about how we can integrate different sources of information. We synthesize, we uh, calculate this vulnerability index, uh, a high degree of disaggregation because it's per block. And we put this in a geovisor that allows the consultation to everybody, but also this information can be downloaded to use and integrate with other policies or other sources of information if it is required. So as you can see, the, informa the geospatial information has a great potential to strengthen the analysis about what is happening in the territory, when it is happening, but especially where is it happening. So all these tools can be enrich the, the analysis of the territory. And obviously we can continue to create more information for the for decision making. Thank you very much. Yeah, good evening from uh, Nigeria. Uh, I am Prince uh, Clem uh, Agba. I am the Honorable Minister of State Budget and National Planning, and also the co-chair for Group 3 uh, Steering uh, Committee. Uh, today is a World Statistics Day, and uh, I think it is by no coincidence that uh, we are having the World Data uh, Forum. Uh, I will be speaking to you on the how we have used just special data to support our response to COVID-19 uh, uh, in uh, Nigeria. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for us, we are very committed to building uh, special data solutions that make development goals achievable in Nigeria. And uh, through the direction of the Grid 3 Nigeria National Steering and Technical uh, Committees, the government of Nigeria aims to improve the country's ability at all levels to use and share the, the core geospatial data as shown on the screen on population settlements, administrative boundaries, and infrastructure for policy planning, decision making, and sustainable. Uh, development. Next slide, please. Uh, grid 3, Nigeria supports COVID-19 uh, responses as uh, follows. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, the president set up a presidential task force on uh, COVID-19 to coordinate the responses across uh, the federation. And uh, Grid 3 uh, provided support to this presidential task force uh, to enable her respond appropriately with data to COVID-19. The project supports the Presidential Task Force on Modeling and Evidence Synthesis Group, as well as the National COVID-19 Response uh, Center. The Modeling and Evidence Synthesis Group of the PTF was led by the University College London, used Grade 3 Nigeria Population Estimates to study the transmission and impact of the virus during lockdown and post lockdown and inform government policy and decision making on the pandemic. The team developed a mathematical model to study transmission according to age and geographical location. 
Grade 3 Nigeria provided information on the locations of people that are social economic vulnerable across the country to the social and economic working group of the presidential tax force. This is to help guide the presidential uh, tax force decision on measures to cushion the effect of COVID-19 on the economic well-being of our people. For the National COVID-19 Response Center, Grade 3 Nigeria was able to support the center to develop a dashboard for visualizing indicators received from various ministries, departments, and agencies responding to COVID-19 situations, as well as for tracking and impact measurement. Grid 3 Nigeria supports the National Bureau of uh, Statistics in collaboration with ISRI and developed a national data hub for the uh, NBS to harmonize and host all COVID-19 related information and other statistical surveys on a single platform that is freely accessible for planning and decision-making purposes. Also, Grade 3 Nigeria supported the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency with web maps, lists of health facilities, and connecting educational institutions close to each other for the 11 local government areas with the highest burden of COVID-19 in Nigeria. The project supported the, Niger uh, the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, whose aim was to determine the establishment of community support centers to host suspected cases of COVID-19 before testing. Grade three also supported the Nigeria Center for Disease control with technical assistance to disaggregate the dual location of confirmed COVID-19 cases to administrative ward boundaries and local government areas so as to better provide insight on the spread of COVID-19 in the country. We also provided uh, support to state, especially uh, Lagos state uh, government uh, as part of our effort in supporting the sub-national uh, governments. I led the Grade 3 Nigerian team in a meeting with the Lagos State Governor and his tax force team on COVID-19 to share analysis of vulnerable populations most at risk across the world in the state in five uh, risk uh, uh, layers. Next slide, please. These uh, risk uh, layers around health facilities access, uh, co-morbidities, communication access, exposure, and socioeconomic vulnerability. These efforts provided insights and basis for policy decisions towards responding to the outbreak in Lagos State. The project also provided population density maps at a 100 by 100 meter spatial resolution showing areas with high density population where social distancing may be challenged. Thank you very much. David Senge, or yes. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I was just waiting for the queue. Um, so I decided that I am speaking without slides today because as a policymaker um, who is cutting across um, education, innovation, and COVID response, I wanted to talk about the evidences and ways in which we I, as, as a country has been using um, data and the different kinds of geospatial data to support our response, not just for health response, but for um, agriculture and also recently for education. 
And so maybe it's important to start with the partnerships that we had. One critical thing I wanted to focus on was partnerships and the partnerships that I want to highlight within and supported by grade three is ones that have to do with just data acquisition. Um, we were able to, through grade three and our relationships, get access to high quality satellite imagery. And we got those satellite imagery and we interacted with our National Statistics Sierra Leone and National Statistics Bureau to get population data. And um, we got enumeration, enumeration area data. We got the boundaries data. And within the academic partnership that GRE3 provides, they've been able to combine the population data at a very low level and the high level satellite data as well from national and um, city level to be able to have enhanced population estimates data, which now has informed and is, is, is being used by Statistics Sierra Leone as they go on with our midterm census. In December, <clears throat> Statistics Sierra Leone will roll out Sierra Leone's first midterm census. And the midterm census planning and the midterm census activities has been informed by the estimates of the the population level data that we've been able to get from our models and, and our partnership with grade three. And DSTI, the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation, which I lead in my capacity as Chief Innovation Officer, has used that same data to apply and solve for multiple challenges. And in fact, DSCI leads on the ICT response for COVID and we needed to estimate people in areas where there was going to be lockdowns, for example, and within Freetown, within the sub-regional area, as we made plans for um, low, high density communities. Um, and those high density communities with informal settlement, you needed, you needed to estimate the population and the needs such that if there was an outbreak there, if there was a contact there, you need to understand how many people who reside in that area. And that data was then used by the presidential task force and was presented to the presidential task force for COVID and discussed in the ICT support group to ensure that we were better planning. And as we made estimates for where to have intervention, so we, as a government, also identified vulnerable groups and had planning for giving them food um, during lockdown and giving them extra resources. Those estimates were also done and found by the data. Yes, the National Social Action, National Commission for Social Action, NAXA, was responsible for providing um, social support and welfare has its own data, but that data was informed and the planning was informed um, from, from our population estimates data. It's important to note then that when it comes to our own work within the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation, we have what we call the um, IGIS, it's a, it's a GIS, integrated GIS platform. And this work is supported from the foundation, the Gates Foundation specifically, and um, through and with the relationship with grid three so both the support from um from the gates foundation to set up this this human capital development incubator from which our gis integrated gis portal comes from and it's at gis.dsti.gov.sl we're able to bring together a summary data set that includes all health all education government facilities, legal water, population, cell tower, and we're using updated population estimates. So we have the choice of using the 2015 census and the population data estimate um, as well. And finally, as an example within the education sector, um, one of the work that we, in my then capacity as Minister of Education, one of the work that we've been doing really with GRE3 um, and within this network and with the academic partners that are there is around school catchment area planning. As a, we need to be able to know where we're building schools. We need to be able to know what schools we, we, we need to have at what level, a primary level at GSS, junior secondary school or senior secondary school. It was important for us that even within our our, our projects, right? So we have a new World Bank multi-donor trust fund. Um, 
we need to build about 510 classrooms. And the goal of that classroom that we're building, those classrooms that we're building, is to ensure that children can have access, that we can reduce the out of school children, and that we can lower our um, gross enrollment rate. We can inform our gross enrollment rate so that children are at school at the right level. And infrastructurally, we also need to ensure that the schools are safer and um, we remove shifts, so social structures. Schools, children go to school in the morning and because we don't have enough structures, others go at different levels in the afternoon. And that planning process, that work has to be informed by really rigorous um, data that involves population estimates population data at the chiefdom level, or at the enumeration area level, and schools data. And within the partnership with, um, with grade three, we've been able to develop um, these analyses that tell us what the distributions of schools are by population and at, by which level, whether um, how much percent of the population is covered and what distances, within what distances, so within a six kilometer distance, for example, um, we have around 99% of the population covered for schools. And when we then break that down per level in urban and rural areas, and per grade, um, age grade breakdown, population age breakdown informed by the grade three work as well, we then begin to really understand how many people are not covered, right? So preschool, for example, um, close to about 45 percent of we know because we didn't have preschool before 2018 as part of the formal education um, um, program uh, about 44 45 percent of our people are not covered whereas in primary school which was our major focus um, less than two percent of the population is excluded and when we are able to then as a ministry and as a government have that level of detailed planning informed by data and those data are aerial imagery and satellite data uh, imagery and in this case i mentioned we got from max and digital globe through our partnership population data that we have from our national statistics um, office from 2015 and uh, the population estimates data that we have from our partnership um, with world pop and with um grade three and those estimates and models and then finally, when we can then collaborate to have analysis and strategic work, like um, as I was mentioning in school catchment area planning, you have everything you need to really directly inform and affect people's lives. And we saw that happen in Sierra Leone with the response, and it still is happening with the response as almost every um, planning work relies on the population estimates uh, data that was, that, that was done with grade three and uh, with World Pop as part of that collaboration. And finally, as we better plan and recover, these are the things that will inform our ongoing census, as I mentioned, we'll have a midterm census in December. Um, and subsequently, when we think about using more data and technology and AI and drones, that will be informed by, by if not real accurate granular data, that we are sure about, it will be informed by their projections. Um, and so we are excited as a country uh, to, to, to be part of this partnership and to be able to share our experiences in the policy framework and how it affects our policy. Thank you. Great, thank you, David. And thank you to the rest of our panelists as well. Uh, these were very compelling presentations. Before we start the interactive discussion, I want to remind the audience that you can submit questions to this panel via the Attendify website where you join the session. Uh, and I think that a few people have already started to put some questions in, so thank you. I'm going to start to open up a few things to all of the panelists here. So panelists, if you want to respond, you can just unmute your video and your microphone and respond. Um, to start us off, how is the environment evolving in countries for integration of Earth observation and geospatial information into national data production, informed policy, and decision-making processes? And what is needed to attain, to attain further acceleration of the adoption of these technologies? Any of the panelists can respond. Yes, thank you. Yes, in Colombia, we identify the potential of the use of air observation data specific to 
SDG indicators. In this sense, we are using their observation to as a support to calculate indicators about the goal 11 or goal 9. We convene this, we link this information with other sources of information like statistical information from census. And yes, we identify the importance of these sources of information to update the frameworks that we use, but also to generate statistics specific for SDGs. So we identify that we need to continue work in this uh, way, uh, continuous improve the capacity, the capacity building in Dani and the use of platforms, online platforms, cloud platforms that allow to process this volume of information. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can also take up. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, okay. Then it's here. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so what I think my contribution here is that uh, uh, specifically within the context of the SDG monitoring, uh, we've seen a lot of. Uh, a lot of a lot of shift from uh, <clears throat> just relying on the conventional data sources to actually uh, adoption of more uh, ad observation geospatial information related and one of the triggers i've seen that is working pretty well is also uh, in context where uh, some countries are learning from others what what they're actually doing and this is sort of also motivating the other countries to also start up taking these technologies and and it's, it's significantly shifting shaping uh, how much uh, adoption is happening. Uh, but of course, as, uh, with, with a lot of challenges uh, in, in terms of capacities and also the systems, as, as more uh, uh, global partners start to develop more friendly uh, systems to help uh, pre-process uh, and even produce data, I think uh, is also motivating a lot of uh, uh, partners and actors and countries to uh, sort of uptake the, these technologies. So, so the future is looking uh, bright. Um, I, I see this a lot in the sensors, uh, specifically the sensors context. Uh, with the geo, geo coding of census information and this getting tied to other sort of uh, information at the national and the city level. So the future really looks good. Thank you, Dennis. Would anybody like to answer this before I move on? All right, I'll start into some of the audience questions. So this one's specifically for Sandra Moreno. How are matters of confidentiality and privacy managed in the vulnerability geovisor, particularly when working at such a disaggregated geographical level and considering that the data is easily downloadable? Thank you. Yes, the geovisor allows downloading the vulnerability index per block. It means that for each per block that we have, the information that we provide is the degree of vulnerability that could be high, medium, or low. The other sensitive data, like health, age, among others, were processed internally by DANE with all the protocols of confidentiality that we have as a national statistics office. So this, this data about health, age, or others are not able, available for download. Uh, I would like to mention something about uh, about this 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 question if I, if, if I can say so. Um, um, uh, when I was talking about the, the the agreements that we have with the geospatial uh, um, with the, the special community and the statistical community is one of this of, of that the, the global statistical geospatial framework is one uh, with his five principles gives this uh, link of the geospatial information taking care of the confidentiality of the statistical information that all the uh, uh, statistical offices in the, in the countries have. This is important and that's why the link of this, these two disciplines, the geospatial and the statistical side, are very important just to, to try to, to, to not to have these this problems of the confidentiality of the information. Thank you, Rolando, for that addition. Uh, we have another question from the audience. 
Uh, how can we best manage geospatial data on mining cities, industrial hubs, special economic zones, manufacturing hubs, free trade zones, border communities, markets, just so we, uh, just so we may be helpful potential investor, oh, sorry, just so we may help potential investors have access to information that would uh, help them inform, make informed decisions to set up businesses in Nigeria. So this one seems specific to Nigeria about how to use data in order to bring more investment in. So perhaps uh, Clem Agba, you might uh, have a better answer for this than others. I think this can probably also apply to some of the other uh, geographies as well though on how to make this a tool for bringing in more business. Yeah. Okay. okay, video. Yeah, you can talk about the the what? I know. Okay. Uh, for N Nigeria, yes, we're just developing Grid 3. And uh, what we are doing uh, right now with Grid 3 is using it uh, for co location of uh, facilities. Uh, we have found out that uh, in a couple of areas, we have so much concentration of amenities to the disadvantage of, uh, of other areas. So as we begin to develop uh, Grid 3 and work uh, with the states, and the federal ministries uh, will use this uh, to build uh, industrial facilities uh, in specific areas that will serve uh, the need uh, of, of our people. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, currently doing is developing uh, a web app uh, application, uh, which we call the, the IMAC uh, uh, application uh, to, for citizens to be able to engage uh, with government on projects and programs that are currently being uh, uh, carried out. And this will be uh, georeferenced, so we know specifically where those uh, projects are and what the outcomes of those projects are, if they really be, be, be met, the actual intention of, uh, of government. So with citizens being engaged, we can tell whether we are over-concentrating in some areas to the disadvantage of other areas, and this will help uh, uh, in policy uh, decisions. Thank you so much for that response, and that segues really well into the next audience question, and this one goes back out to all of the panelists. Uh, so is your data only obtained for the city level? What about indigenous people territories? Rolando, it looks like you might have something to add. Okay, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, so is the data obtained only at the city level or are there are also indigenous people's territories uh, captured as well? No, um, um, in, in some countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, so uh, as you have the, the census information, so you can you 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 can have only for uh, you can have information for citizens for cities for uh, provinces and even if you decide for for indigenous uh, and, and in other and in other in some other um, uh, population like woman like uh, gender uh, 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 gender sorry uh, age groups or whatever. So if you have the information, you can you reference all the all the information according to the uh, uh, the census uh, population. For example, uh, Colombia has made a, an extraordinary uh, effort in that in this regard. And some other countries, uh, Chile uh, has some information in, the, in that regard. And so we can in Mexico uh, have the information in, in this in this regard. So if you have information, the statistics information, you can identify and you reference all the all, all this information. Great. Any other responses to that question before I move on? Yes. Um, yes. In Colombia, we the vulnerability index is calculated by the urban areas. However, we have information for rural areas and disaggregate by indigenous people about the information about poverty and 
demographic characteristics. At the beginning, we work with the citizens because we know that in these citizens where are a lot of density of population, there are places with greater affection. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, yes, I see my video seems frozen, but you can hear me. So I wanted to highlight uh, a recent uh, uh, hackathon that uh, took place earlier um, this year, focusing in particular on indigenous communities. And, and there was a geo COVID-19 uh, hackathon that took place as a crowdsourcing challenge for indigenous communities to, to design um, their uh, solutions to the pandemic while leveraging Earth observations. Um, so there is um, uh, a lot of activity happening, especially within, at the international level, the group on Earth observations, um, in terms of uh, both how the EU community can learn from indigenous peoples and, and how can those perspectives be integrated in and, and help support uh, um, needs uh, that pertain to, to local communities, including indigenous communities. Thank you. Thank you, RG. All right, I've got a question for David Senge. So are you constructing school catchment areas using buffers as the crow flies, or are you using isochrones or another time-based model? I think when you uh, are at the place where we are, where when you have a new policy that now has, we expanded the population of school attendees by about 34% within one year. When you have 600,000 people coming to your schools because you made a policy that says free quality school education for everyone, what you most care about is where are those children, which classrooms do I need to build based on the population and based on the need. So it's a singular, um, population based age grade a single time stamp. Um, we're not doing a temporal population growth. Uh, there will be a point when we have met our needs. We've not satisfied our needs yet. For now, it really is just a question of where are my people? Where are those who are out of school? How old are they? What schools do I need for them? And um, the simple algorithms that we're using now is, which we actually have rolled out, I needed, there are some chiefdoms that didn't have junior secondary schools. So if you are a child who goes to primary school, and particularly for girls, they have to send you to another chiefdom to go to junior secondary school. And parents are not going to send their children um, just away if, if it's like a really far distance. Um, and then the tendency, if you're a girl, that you drop out at class six, primary school is higher. Um, and so in those chiefdoms. And so some of the things that we have done um, now is to look at chiefdoms where there were no junior secondary schools or senior secondary schools. Look at the villages that have the largest demand based on population, based on other existing primary schools or junior schools, depending on the level that you want, and use that as the optimum location, right? We can think about in the future, we can include road accessibility, we can include water, we can include other variables. But for now, it's looking at demand population needs um and 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 choosing a location based on that optimizing based on that great thank you thank you david uh one more question from the audience are there some confidentiality measures followed for very low level geographical data so this i think can go out to any of the panelists who are capturing uh, low level subnational data uh, what confidentiality measures are you following? If I can say something about uh, the confidentiality. Um, um, so uh, uh, the confidentiality, it is differs from um, different countries. For example, uh, when you have uh, um, in some countries, uh, in Mexico, they have confidentiality at the level of uh, two or three people uh, that can be uh, be shown the, the information if you have only two or three people in one grid or, or one cell or one um, uh, uh, block. But in some others, the first, the, the numbers of, 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 uh, of people that, that can be uh, shared. So, um, but uh, as, I, as I mentioned, so 
if, uh, if you have coordination with the uh, statistical offices and the geospatial community, so it, it, that that you can solve this process and you can solve it with any uh, problems of, of confidentiality uh, to, to be shown and, and for all the for all the people in in, in a platform. Thank you, Rolando. Does anybody else have anything to add? All right, if not, before we move to our discussion, I have one last question for you. Um, so some of those panelists have spoke to this, but I wanted to give the rest of the group a chance to elaborate. How are organizations, especially national ministries, using partnerships for enhanced adoption of geospatial information technologies in their data systems and in COVID-19 response? Well, in the in Colombia, we work with some different partnerships uh, that allows to have access to the information. As I mentioned before, we work with the Social Ministry of Health and Social Protection, and with the National Department of Planning. And also, we share this experience with other national institutions, like the Central America, uh, in which we work with workshops that uh, allow to teach how uh, use this data, how, how they can replicate the process and calculate their own vulnerability index. So yes, definitely it's important to work in a partnership with other institutions, share the experience, the lessons learned and learn from the others. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Does anybody else wanna to speak to partnerships? I, I, I just want uh, no go ahead okay uh in nigeria we we work with the relevant uh, mdas like i said uh, during the uh, covid 19 we we had to work with the presidential tax uh, force uh trying to know what their needs are and then to overlay our data in order to give them uh uh data to enable them to take the right decisions. Uh, like I said, we work with Lagos State uh, uh, Government. We, we work with the Presidential Tax Force. We had to work with uh, the Nigerian Bureau of uh, uh, Statistics, where a dashboard was put uh, in place uh, so that the, uh, we have an evidence-based uh, data to use in, in decision uh, uh, making. So that's the kind of partnership uh, we are having. And grid three for us is still uh, evolving. We are still collating uh, data. We don't have everything that we, we need yet, but as we work with the various uh, MDAs, we get to know their needs and then we provide the, the, the data. Thank you. Uh, Rolando, over to you. Yes, I just uh, want to, to, to mention that um, in, in particular in our region, but, I, but I'm sure that in, in, in a lot of uh, countries in the world, um, so the, the coordination between the statistical offices and your special offices and the governmental uh, institutions with uh, align with the with the, the non -govern non governmental um, uh, organizations so it was very strong just to give the continuity and to produce information to, to for, for the, the decision making for the governments this was very very important and in particular in these cases so you can see, for example, in Spain, you, you saw, or in Mexico, you saw the information that used that uh, the, the, from the mobile uh, offices, uh, companies, um, that uh, the telephone companies use and give to the statistical offices to, to, to give this following and tracking all the, 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 the positions. And, 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 and I think uh, the coordination and the link of, of this uh, parameter was very strong and in particular, this pandemic was awesome. Thank you so much. And I would love to thank all of my panelists once again and one last time for all of your participation and your wonderful presentations today. I will now hand off to Juan Daniel Oviedo, who will be our ending discussant.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be the discussion of this tremendously rich panel session under which uh, I think that it was absolutely clear that when we had to face the risk management challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it looks like that the linkage or the marriage between geospatial information and statistical information was uh, already consolidated and was uh, already playing an important role uh, disseminating and allowing uh, information on more specifically statistical information to become evidence in order to illustrate public policy. Uh, when, we, when we have to face a risky situation, I think that uh, there is a important opportunity to, to innovate. And I believe that all the presentations that, that we have seen in this panel session are showing how uh, the structures and the concepts that lie behind the geospatial information management and statistical information being able to be uh, interoperable with geospatial information was highly useful in order to provide answers to policymakers in order to better manage the uh, really, really complex situations that we were, we, or we have been facing during the last six to seven months. And that's why uh, in, taking into account that today is the World Statistics Day, uh, it's highly important and this puts into evidence that current reliable and trusted information is highly important, that is highly important when we put them in a data ecosystem that allows dialogues between such a rich information and which is geospatial information and a statistical information to better address uh, public policy challenges. I think that uh, from the discussions and from the questions from the audience and from the panel session, we see that one of the main challenges that we are facing in this uh, linkage between geospatial information and statistical information is the reliability, disaggregation versus privacy trade-off that we have to manage. And that's why I, I want to take into account one of the main contributions of Roland Campo, which is the chief of the statistics division of ECLAC of the United Nations and Latin American and Caribbean countries that we have a very strong uh, international community both at the geospatial uh, dimension and at the same time at the statistical dimension and that's why the discussions that are going to be uh, managed in the following months or years are very important to be interdisciplinary in order to uh, uh, allow our society to take advantage of this integration between geospatial information and statistical information. So I think this is which is highly valuable in the 2030 agenda under which the main challenge is that we have to put development centered at the citizen or at the enterprises and at their closest environment as the street block level in Colombia or the grids of Nigeria or several uh, examples that, for example, UN Habitat was showing today with us. And we see that this calls for something that uh, at the statistical offices we are uh, discussing in our international community, which is the the interaction between stewardship and innovation. And that's why uh, in order to allow the discussions that are to follow, uh, we need to take into account that this information has to be used in order to uh, uh, 
make it feasible and to make the socioeconomic problems that we are illustrating in those maps or in those grids or in those simulation scenarios the, to be visible for the public and policy makers. And that's why and we cannot forget uh, that this integration between geospatial information and statistical information is a, a means and it's, it's not the main objective. And the main objective is the what for question. The what for question is how are we going to make this information to be useful for the public policy challenges that our countries are facing. And that's why we need to discuss about capacity development, both from the technological perspective, from the human skills that are going to manage these uh, tons of information or disaggregated or granular information. And, and that's why I would like to challenge the international communities, both at the global framework, at the regional frameworks, and at the national data governance frameworks that we have to develop in order to allow this integration to be very productive in a setting, um, a setting ways in order to face the development challenges in, in our countries. And that's why uh, I would like to invite some of the comments uh, that we grasped from the presentations that we need to uh, increase the learning community levels of both the uh, geospatial and statistical information international communities. Regional systems are essential to face the differential challenges of uh, the usefulness or the what for question of the integration of geospatial and statistical information. And that's why we need to be very, very, very uh, forward looking as regards as how this information and how these standards and the interoperability and the data governance frameworks of the integration of geospatial and statistical information is going to provide or to become a toolbox for several analyses that are going to be very useful in order this information to become evidence as economic geography, uh, spatial econometrics, optimization of transport modeling, um, let's say uh, urban development and urban expansion of main cities, for example, in African countries, environmental uh, challenges as greenhouse gas emissions and how are we going to control them? Or even, even we could be very useful in order to solve the problem of illegal, illegal or illicit mining that is very costly for the environment in our countries. That's why I, I'm very convinced, I am very convinced that the, the presentations that we have seen today are showing that this linkage between geospatial and statistical information is going to be a catalyzing platform in order to uh, allow the 2030 agenda to become feasible and to become real and to produce results to our citizens, to our enterprises, to our regions and to our countries. Thank you very much.